Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O God. Now, when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us now open with the word of prayer. Good and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My mom and I were talking this week. And I was talking to her about Psalm 72 and the theme for today. And immediately she had a story to share. And she shared a story about an independent living center uh, that was dedicated to supporting those um, with any kind of disability to live independently. And the director, the director was a charismatic leader that people thought was, was somebody that they could trust and that they could get behind. And then they found out that he had embezzled $250,000. $250,000. And she said that they obviously fired him, brought charges against him, but the organization never really fully uh, recovered. And she said, you know, leadership can take down an organization and a community so far that it can't even come back. Leadership matters. In ancient Israel, in the time of the prophet Samuel, the people of God According to Samuel and Kings, those books, the people of God were demanding a king, a leader here on earth. And Samuel said to them, but God is your leader. God is your king. God is the one that you pay tribute to, that you have allegiance toward, the one that you follow and the one that will care for you. But they demanded a leader, a king. And so finally, Samuel said, okay, you can have a king, but let me tell you what will happen. A human king, a human leader will start to let the power get to, it. at that time it was a him, his head. And he will, will take your sons and make slaves of them to build monuments in his own name. He will take your daughters for himself. And in the reign of Solomon, we could see that happening. Solomon is known for having many wives and even more concubines. Solomon was known for building the temple of God. And as I always say, when you look at temples and cathedrals, you see the backs of the poor on whom these things were made, both by taking wealth away and also by the, their labor. And the, the king that was charged 
through Psalms like Psalm 72, when the king was coronated, the king was charged and expected by God to care for the people, to protect the people, to lead the people, to lift up the people, to do God's justice in the world. But time after time, the kings failed. Time after time, the kings fell short. And so finally, you ended up with uh, the book of Daniel in chapter 7, when kingdoms of the world were described as beasts. And one beast would come and devour everything in its mists. And the other beast would come and devour that beast and devour everything in its midst. And everything that that beast missed, the next beast would devour. And then finally the fourth beast came and as I like to remind book study and Bible study, that uh, beast had horns. It wasn't a human looking beast, it was a beast. And it had horns and it had one little horn, that final annoying king that would come and it was the loud arrogant king, that horn that wouldn't be quiet. You can just see it making lots of noise. And then the ancient one came in the vision of Daniel. The ancient one being God and the ancient one anointed for the ancient one, the son of man, the son of humanity, the fully human one that was not a beast, but rather represented God on earth and was the leader the people needed to care for the people. This was the promise in the vision of Daniel. This was the promise of, of the visions that we see in Revelation. When the people are oppressed, when the people are hurting, when justice is not being done, when our leaders are failing us time after time, God always promises to come and to send a leader that would do God's justice, God's will, that would care for those most hurting, poor, vulnerable, and oppressed. This is the promise of Psalm 72. It's not just a promise, but it's also an expectation of the leaders. And so when Jesus says to the disciples, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that the son of man, the son of humanity is? What he's saying is that he is the son of humanity. He is the fully human one who comes to be not a beast that devours the world around him, but comes to bring God's reign, God's rule on earth. And this is a rule that is founded in righteousness. This is a rule that is founded in peace and justice. This is a rule that cares for the blood of the, those most weak, vulnerable, and harmed by the brokenness of humanity. This is the rule of the one who washes the feet, who lifts people up, who cares, who raises people from the depths of death and brings them into new life. And so Peter gets it right. Don't worry, because next week he'll get it wrong. But this week, he, we hear him getting it right. And he says, you are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. The king that was promised to come. Because you see, when Psalms like 72 were used over and over for the coronation of the king, and the kings kept failing and disappointing the people, just like this, this organizational head, this director of this independent living facility. When the people's hopes were crushed and dashed in human leaders, they started to see those psalms as the promises of the coming Messiah, the anointed one who would bring God's reign and God's rule here on earth. And that is indeed what the people, what the disciples experienced in Christ Jesus. In many of the Gospels, we hear images of how Jesus reveals to us who God is. God is the righteous one. God is the loving one. God is the caring one. God is the one who knows you 
and is with you always. God is the one who demands justice. But in this imagery, when Jesus identifies himself as the son of humanity, the fully human one, he's revealing to us what it means, what it looks like to be fully human. You see, we were created in the image of God. We were created to be God's anointed. This is for people who are Christians, who are baptized into Christ. We are anointed. We will say next week, as we baptize Adam, we will say that you are marked by the cross of Christ. And we will put oil on his head, and we will mark him with the cross, and we will say you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. You are anointed. You are anointed to be God's chosen one, to live out God's reign here on earth. The reign that promises that justice will be the rule of the day. The reign that promises that there is abundant grain for everyone and we need to share it. The reign that promises that we're going to um, come to know and care for those most marginalized and oppressed in our society, and we're going to walk up into new life together. The rain that promises that when someone's voice is suppressed, we will walk alongside and maybe a step behind to lift up to help them lift up their own voice, to find their own voice. We're not talking over someone, but we're letting someone else find voice. This week, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of women's rights to vote. We have in this nation what they did not have centuries ago. We have the right to vote. And sometimes we don't take it seriously. Election offices will say, we had a stellar turnout at 40%. 50% is practically unheard of. We celebrate that in our county, we're having upwards of 70%. And our election, through our mail-in voting practices, our election office is predicting that in Clark County, we could have, and in Washington State, we could have upwards of 80, 90 percent for our, our election, our general election in November. It's excellent. But here's what the women in our congregation had to say about women's right to vote. I asked them, we're commemorating 100 years of women's right to vote. What do you think about this right? And what would you like to say to young people today? And so this is what our women said. At our small group gathering on the day after, on August 19th, 2020, we discussed women's right to vote, our struggles to get there and what we have and would say to young voters today. Although the women were given the right to vote 100 years ago, they were denied the privilege many times because of the state that they lived in, the color of their skin, the country of their country of origin, poll taxes, intimidation, and other means to suppress their votes. We are seeing some of these taxes, tactics today to limit people's right to vote. We think it's very important to educate yourself on the ideals of people running and understand the issues and then vote, but also encourage others to vote. We were encouraged by the number of young people expressing their ideas, helping with campaigns, and being involved in other ways. We all ha have encouraged our children and our grandchildren to exercise this privilege and will continue to do so. Otherwise, we agreed if you don't vote, don't complain. If, you, if the vote doesn't go your way or the way you'd like it to go. Another woman emailed me later and said, those who must obey the laws should have a voice in making them. We have an ability to choose our leaders, and so we have to ask ourselves, what qualities do we look for in our leaders?
What qualities do we look for in ourselves when we have leadership opportunities? Whether we lead our own selves in our own lives, whether we lead our families or co-lead our relationships, whether we lead our organization or our ch- lead in our church or lead in our nation, whatever leadership role you have, what characteristics are you embodying? My friend who taught me about leadership told me there's a difference between authority and power. Authority is being put in a, in a position, in a position where you are in charge. And so often, too often, as we saw in the kings of Israel and often in our leaders today, it gets to our heads. It gets to our heads and we start to forget that we are to serve the people that we lead. Walk alongside, lift up. Instead, we start to want power over. We start to want our voice only to be heard. We start to want to, uh, to gain more for ourselves in greed. We stop listening. Instead, my friend said, leaders are called to have power, the ability to act to influence others. And they are given this power by earning it through trusting relationships with the people that they lead. So when we choose leaders, do we choose them because they're people that we trust? Do we choose them because they have values that we appreciate? When we are given positions of leadership, do we realize that it is a sacred trust given to us by the people? So do we commit to God who expects us to follow the way of Christ, to follow his fully humanness? Do we commit to listening? Do we commit to caring? Do we commit to sharing the abundance around us? Do we commit to being servant leaders who lift up together and walk alongside rather than try to have power over? We have rights in this country that are a gift of grace from God. We have the ability to lead. We have the ability to choose our leaders. And yes, it doesn't always go our way. But as our women in our church remind us, we must continually strive for justice. Because us humans, we fall short of being fully human. Sometimes the beast within us, no offense to beasts, sometimes the beasts within us rear their ugly heads. I know it happens to me. And so when I came into leadership here at this church, one of the first things I said to you was, I will fall short sometimes, and I will need to ask for your forgiveness, and I pray that you'll offer it to me. You will fall short sometimes and have to ask me forgiveness, and I pray that I will offer it to you. So let us pray for our leaders. Let us choose our leaders wisely Let us lift up our voices, and when we have the opportunity to lead, whether it's our families, our children, our students, our organizations, our very lives, let us be guided by Christ, the fully human one, who teaches us how to be just, how to be kind, how to listen, and how to care, how to share the abundant gifts that God has given us. And now, beloved children of God, and may the peace of Christ, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in the same Christ Jesus, now and always. Amen.